So let's get started. The narrative, what does it mean? You know, it's it's confusing these days. Could gas be the new coal under Biden? The coal industry is back, Trump proclaimed. Democrats run from the Green New Deal. China accuses the U.S. of being a climate troublemaker. China, <laughs> you know, and the president of China tells the U.N. that China will be carbon neutral within the four decades. It's just all over the board, and a lot of it is kind of silly nonsense, to be candid with you. So I'll start with my favorite philosopher, Yogi Berra. If the world was perfect, it wouldn't be. We know the world's not perfect. So again, I'm hoping you can hear me <laughs> and, see my, and see my slides. Does everybody have sound? So, you know, in the time of COVID. I'm going to start a big picture and we'll pull it into the U.S. electricity. But let's think about some big issues facing the, the world today. And I've listed several of them. In fact, when I highlight many in orange here, those all relate to poverty of some kind. And energy is an important component of poverty, as we'll see. Climate change is another big discussion that's going on, and people are trying to paint this as climate or energy. Uh, there's more to the environment than just climate, the land, the air, the use of water. So it's really climate change and energy and the land and the water. Climate, land, air, and water, they're all part of a healthy environment. So it's really environment and energy and poverty. We talk about these things together, and poverty, of course, is part of a larger economy. So it's really this waltz, the energy, the economy, and the environment. And I've been speaking about these for, for decades now. Uh, land, air, and water on the, on the environmental side, poverty, competition, growth, and fossil nuclear renewable energies. It's complicated. Legal, social, political systems, they're very interactive. They're not simple. I call that overlap space the radical middle. It's radically lonely sometimes, and I'll bet you feel that too. Uh, it takes critical thinking. We have to really think about the pros and the cons and be willing to be nonpartisan and, and objective about these things. So we, we're in the middle of an election still somehow, and, and, the, and the right party thinks they own fossil and nuclear and, and control the economy, and the left thinks they own renewable and, and the environment, and that's all pretty silly. It's not really very critically thinking. Reminds me of this guy, you know. Oh, yeah, that boat part goes in first. <laughs> you know, we've got to think more critically. Non-critical thinking, here are some. Renewables are clean and good, and fossil fuels are dirty and bad. This just isn't critical thinking. The reality is most people don't know how electricity is made, and I think you probably understand that very well. In fact, I speak all over the world, and sometimes I'm told it comes out of a plug. That's where electricity comes from. So given that as a context, let's talk about the economy and energy and the environment. We'll start with a COVID moment here. Uh, if you thought buying toilet paper was tough, just wait till 300 million of us want to get a haircut at the exact same moment. Anyway, so I come in and, and, and I want to show you the only slide on the actual COVID that I think is fascinating. This is this goes from youngest at the top to oldest at the bottom. And on the left side, is the number of cases percentage-wise something to 100. And young people get this disease, this infection, more than old people, it turns out. And I highlighted kind of the college-age kids there. Mine are all out of college, except we still have one. And on the other hand, those who die from the disease tend to be on the older end. I'm in that yellow bar, that 60 to 64 group. So you can see how this kind of drives different behaviors in different age groups, different demographics, and globally, depending on the population. Nonetheless. Here's my picture that reminds me of this year, 2020, you know, when we just get out of 2020 and out of the COVID year. Um, it'll probably become a verb someday, you know, oh, it's a real 2020, <laughs> you know, or an adjective. And we'll, know, we'll all know what that means. So we're going to talk about poverty here. Start with the population density map of the world. Red is very dense population, and white, not very dense. Not too many people live in the areas that I'm highlighting here. And we'll put look at what that means for energy and other things in just a minute. Now, if I come into the global income map of the world, you can see those areas. They're colored gray. We, we don't calculate incomes where not many people are living. Now, on the low end, less than $1,000 per year. That's about 3 bucks a day and up to even $10 a day. We see that these areas are concentrated. That kind of poverty exists everywhere, but it's concentrated in the, in the ovals here. 
We made a film called Switch On recently. I hope you've had a chance to see it. It's at switchon.org. And we went to the places I've shown with stars here, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nepal, Vietnam, Colombia, and looked at lots of different kinds of energy poverty. The film is called Switch On. And check it out. It's on YouTube and it's online. On the higher end, as we move up that income scale to the purples and the blues, and the low end of the blue is $12,000 a year. That's a thousand bucks a month. It's still quite low. But the blue areas are tightly concentrated. And I put on some geography here. The, the wealthy areas are north of the Tropic of Cancer, 20 degrees north, and south of Capricorn, 20 degrees south. Now I'm going to show you a map of the world's annual mean temperature. And you can see where we don't live much. It's really hot or really cold. Okay. Where do we live? Where is it wealthy? Ah, it's just right. Goldilocks, not too warm, not too cold. And you can see those here. Now, where it's really hot, it's often very poor as well. And as are shown by the oval. So there's a warranted concern that raising the temperature of the earth up to three degrees more, about 10% more, will impact poor people who live in the equatorial regions. And that's warranted. But what will help people, including people who are just emerging? Energy. So here's a map of the world's electricity and night composite photo of satellites. Look where the lights are on. It's wealthy. In fact, a nocturnal luminosity lights at night against GDP per person shows a very strong correlation. These are all the countries in the world. The more electricity you have, the wealthier you tend to be. And I put the geography back on, and you can see there aren't many lights on in the equatorial regions. Here are some of the coasts, etc. But for the most part, a lack of energy. So there's a warranted understanding that energy will help the world's poor, just like it helps the world's rich. So what does it really mean, little no energy? Well, there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who are good at math and those who aren't. Well, which of the three are you? So I'm going to do some simple arithmetic here. Kilowatt hours per year, you know what this means, but most people don't. I'm showing you Ethiopia and Kenya that we feature, but other countries as well. The average person in these countries consumes less than my refrigerator. In fact, my fridge consumes nine times more electricity than the average Ethiopian and three times more than the average Kenyan. That's energy poverty. So if I take poverty across the bottom, that $3 a day against electrification rate, we look at Latin America first, mostly electrified each country, and some severe poverty. The size of the circle is proportional to population, Brazil being the largest. Same scale, here comes Asia. China and India live large, but some massive populated countries, less electrified, more poverty, and another billion people in Africa, less electrified by quite a bit in severe poverty. And again, I'm showing you Kenya and Ethiopia. So there's this relationship between poverty and access to electricity. And, and it's a paradox. Uh, energy doesn't end poverty, but you can't end poverty without energy. Now, how many people live without electricity? About a billion people in the world still today. And the trends are good. It's been coming down over the last couple of decades. But a billion people, here's a map color-coded by population. The Western Hemisphere is about a billion. Every color on this map is about a billion people. The whole Western Hemisphere, about a billion. We're not evenly distributed. I'll talk about that more in a minute. You can see Southeast Asia, many billion people. It's about a billion without electricity in the world today. How many cook like Sana Kanchi, who we featured in our film, Switch On, indoors with wood, biomass, hay, dung? It turns out about a third of the world is still cooking indoors that way, with the smoke and the pollutants and the particulates that come along with that. The diseases are rampant from that. In fact, it kills about 3 million people every single year in the world. COVID has killed about 1.3 million globally so far, and that's a terrible thing. 1.3 million, 3 million every year just breathing indoor smoke. And it's so solvable. Electricity will help. So here's severe poverty. I mean, $2 a day now. It's been coming down as a percentage of the world's population, which is a good thing. Population continues to grow. Now, the pre-COVID estimate was for it to continue to come down. Post-COVID, it's flattened and starting to come up a little bit. Poverty rates are coming up. The UN said, hey, if it's 5% global GDP reduction, what would poverty look like? How about 10 or 20? And poverty comes back up tremendously in a 5, 10, and 20% GDP drop world from the year that's just passed. What's actually happening? Well, you can see the world in April 20, 
we forecast about a 3% drop in GDP. The red line is zero with compared to the year. So anything below the red line would be a negative GDP change. There's a lot of countries in the world and they're sorted by continent, okay? Now, you can see here that uh, the drop in October, we made another forecast, this is another forecast was done, and it fell, the world fell to about a 5% GDP drop. In fact, many of the countries in the world fell to that kind of drop. And you can see them here. You know, from April to October, things are getting worse than most countries than we originally thought. A few went up, and I'll show those here in green, but not too many. So if I remove the April forecast, now we're just looking at the October, which will probably be pretty close to how the year ends. It's a wide range, but there are a lot of countries that are going to be lower than 5% with a world average around 5 And just a few that are positive. And they're not in Europe and North America. They tend to be in, in the Middle East and, and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. It's interesting where the growth is actually happening. So lastly, we'll look at GDP per person across the bottom against the electricity consumption per person. And here are some of the large economies in the world. Back in 1990, a very strong trend. The more electricity you consume, the wealthier you are with GDP as that measure. Now let's fast forward 25 years and you can see a big shift. GDP goes up without consuming much more electricity per person in the wealthy nations, efficiency. The mid-range countries are shifting up both ways, more electricity and more wealth, particularly South Korea. Look in the lower left, China and India, stuck in the lower left just back in 1990. Now, China moves quite a bit, and India barely moves. And you can see this trend, India, China, South Korea, the United States. That's about a third of the world's population, those four countries alone. A very strong correlation between access to electricity and GDP. China is the largest economy in the world now. It passed the United States several years ago and is rising still, not per person, but in the aggregate, a lot of people. If we take a look at this again, we made a film called Switch several years ago that featured energy as the star, and it's been seen by 15 million folks all over the world in 50 countries. But we kind of left out a big part of the world that didn't have much energy, and that's why we made this next film, Switch On. And they want to do what we've got. They want to grow and industrialize. And it would be pretty cool if they could do it without consuming as much energy per person in order to grow, and it's possible. Nonetheless, we see these trends from 1990 to 2015, a lower slope, that's good, and perhaps even going toward that yellow line as we get better use of our electricity. It's time to power the people, and, and two of the greatest inhibitors to this are energy access, and, and then to the energy access are, are distribution, something you struggle with and, and do very well in the rural electric co-ops. You distribute electricity, affordable and reliable to people, and then corruption. Corruption looms large at all levels for prohibiting access to energy. So let's talk about energy, another COVID thought here. Now, we, we didn't go to restaurants, kids aren't signed up for anything, and we just stayed home for the summer. It sounds like my childhood, you know, what, what's changed? So back to our map of the population of the world, about a billion people per color. This is the world's energy mix today. My slides are all color-coded. Green is oil, red is gas, gray is coal. Nuclear and orange, hydro and blue, and renewables and various kinds of yellow. And that's the world's mix. It's about 85% fossil fuels. North America is about the same as the global mix, and so is Europe, it turns out. Russia is half natural gas. This isn't electricity. This is all energy. About half natural gas. Topography and rainfall in South America, so you get blue hydro. Gray for coal in Africa. The Middle East is largely oil and gas. That won't surprise anybody. They're doing some other things. Now look at Southeast Asia. One, two, three, four billion people get half of their energy from coal. Now, I'm going to shrink and grow these to be proportional to demand. Here we go. There's actual consumption. Half the world's population is getting half of its energy from coal. That's more than the rest of the world combined times three. That's the data. And has it changed through time? It has. Since 1965, it's gone up almost 400%. Now, Oil and coal haven't gone up as much as the global growth, and natural gas has gone up a lot more, and then nuclear and hydro and renewables have been growing across that time period. What else is growing? We are. The population of the world is headed toward 10 or 11 billion people, and we consume the energy. This is correlation and causation here. So 
About four out of five people live in Africa or Asia today. Four out of five, you saw the map. And they're consuming less than half of the world's energy. 20% of it consume more than half. The wealthy nations. Now those emerging and developing economies are growing. You can see the red line. Their electricity and energy consumption is growing. So population. Western Europe and the United States combined are about 520 million people. The rest of the world are 7.7 billion people in the whole world. So Western Europe and the U.S. represent less than 7% of the global population today. And this, this has to cause us to think about things because demand is growing globally and pretty rapidly. What's going to be our role in the future? Some will say the world, the whole world would be wind, water, and solar if it was just for political will. I say by when, I model it up to 2065, almost fully renewable, and that's what it would look like. Solar and wind and yellow and hydro and other water forms in blue. I mean, how does that look to you? Some people are saying we'll do that by 2040. Really? I, I worry that, that these folks believe in magic energy. You know, it's going to here. It's going to come from somewhere. Magic energy, because it just doesn't look realistic to me at all. Here's a 75% renewable future by 2065. Here's 50%. And then we'll go to even 25% renewable. And people will call that business as usual. All the new energy demand in the world is met with Hydro, solar, wind, and, and nuclear. Fossil fuels decreasing with coal decreasing the most. And business as usual. So there's that same data, the business as usual model from left to right. And I'm going to show it to you now, the exact data, but as a percentage of so the energy mix. Left to right, here's what the mix looks like globally then. The left side of that doesn't look anything like the right side. Coal and oil are cut in half. Natural gas and nuclear double. Renewables go up four times. That's not going to be easy. As you know, as you begin to integrate energy, uh, intermittent renewable energy into your systems in a basic electric co-op. So the United States crude oil has looked like this. We Our production was plummeting because there's a lot of oil and gas in the future. So we have to ask, is there enough? The imports were increasing and we weren't exporting anything. And then just over a decade ago, something big happened. Watch what happens to production. It goes way up. Imports go way down. And we begin to export oil for the first time. And that is thanks to shale. That's shale oil that has made a remarkable amount of increase in production in the United States. It's doubled it in a decade. It's a phenomenal story. Now, where are the shales, the big shales? Here's the shale gas basins in red. Now, on the oil side, North Dakota, you're up in your country. Oil, a little bit's been produced down in Texas. Now, here's the Midland. It's like the Marcellus of oil. Giant original oil in place. And just a little, with all that drilling, it's been produced so far. There's a lot of this kind of oil and gas in the world. It's technologically challenging and it can be very expensive. But it's not just in the U.S. The world has it and it's going to begin to develop it. So only 3% of the gas and 2% of the oil has been recovered today. It's, it's a remarkable uh, challenge, but also opportunity in oil and gas. So another COVID moment, sit. <laughs> and it does, you know, damn mask. <laughs> and I can relate very strongly to this because my wife and I just got another puppy with a little hunting dog, golden retriever. And we've been having these evenings ourselves. So um, what, what, is, what has COVID done? A lot, of, a lot of noise out there in this narrative about demand going away forever. Well, on the gasoline side, here's 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And you can see from 13 and 19 in the U.S., gasoline demand increased. And you can see winter to summer months, we drive more and coming off. What happened in COVID? Well, it was going along at a new rate and it plummeted. But guess what? It's already come back to 13 or 14 levels, and it won't be long for where it's right back where it was. In fact, on the world oil production and consumption, here's world consumption. It plummeted in COVID. We shut down the global economy in order to protect against the, the pandemic. And what happens when you shut down consumption? Well, production drops too. And so tremendous changes in demand and supply and price on the layoffs and pain in the oil and gas industry. But the forecast going forward, and this is EIA, is that consumption is going to come back like you're seeing in gasoline, and demand and production will lag that. 
you can't catch up to that consumption quickly because all the rigs have been shut down, et cetera. So when you get consumption pulling on production, price goes up. And we'll probably see some price shocks in the not too distant future. The other big thing on this that's COVID effect, you'll hear a lot that the oil industry is dead. The investment has left it. Well, this is the price of Brent crude. It's kind of the world global mark for oil price along with West Texas. And this is the investment in the upstream oil and gas industry in trillions of dollars. Do you think they're related? I mean, the price goes up, more investment, the price comes down, less investment. We're at a very low price time now with not much investment. But as this starts to come back and price goes up, guess what's going to happen? So let's talk about electricity in here. We talked about big energy. Most people don't know where it comes from, I mentioned. Well, we make it. You make it. You burn coal, make boil water, make steam, turn a turbine, run a generator. You burn oil, and you burn a lot more natural gas globally than ever before. Another source of heat is nuclear. And then we have gravity, hydro, and then the solar, which is both heat and light conversion, and wind, motion from the wind, and then geothermal and biomass. That's it. Those are the big sources of electricity in the world. Now, how is it consumed and where in terawatt hours? And not this isn't capacity. This is actually energy generation. Total North America and Europe have been flat for almost two decades in our consumption. Who's going up? Asia. Tremendous growth in the demand in Asia. The rest of the world, not much yet. Remember, the rest of the world, as you've seen, is, is quite poor, just emerging and beginning to develop. Now, if you take a look at clump these differently, the wealthy nations, the OECD club of about 30 nations, again, flat in electricity demand. The non-OECD, look at the rate of growth in electricity demand, and it continues to grow steeply as they begin to electrify and make all of our stuff, produce stuff. My country, China, and then the U.S. are the biggest, and it comes on down. And there's a country, there's somebody missing here. This is 2012. In 2018, you see China go up a lot, India almost doubled. The U.S. goes up a little bit in our electricity consumption. But who's missing? Turns out it's the tech sector. Technology consumes more electricity than any nation on Earth, even more than India still. If you don't believe me, look around. <laughs> you know, you know, our kids are on them. I took this picture at our daughter's soccer game. We were dutifully watching the game, I promise, on our cell phones. You know, so this tech sector, the cloud, huge electricity demand centers, okay? About 4% of the world's electricity is, is, is consumed by technology. And that thing called the cloud, it makes somewhere between 40 and 400 million tons of CO2 every year. You know, it's no wonder they call it a cloud. Uh, and it's no wonder Jeff and the gang are making all these promises, net zero emissions, 100% renewables. Companies just are tripping over each other to make promises in the future. So are countries. So are U.S. states, by the way. What if the world could, could change from coal to natural gas? Well, Here's the coal consumption. It's coming down in North America and Europe quite a bit. We built on coal, but now we're doing something else with it. Look at Asia. I mean, the amount of coal in Asia, as you've seen, is three times the rest of the world. And the rest of the world doesn't consume much coal. Now, if you look at just three countries, there's the United States growing and then rolling over. Here's China at the same scale. It's phenomenal, and they're still building coal power plants. And here's India. Same population as China, but just getting started. China is constructing 120 gigawatts of coal today. 120 gigawatts of coal. Yes, a lot of wind as well. 23 gigs capacity factors have to be figured in here. But it's remarkable to power that economy. What's India going to do? Let's shift India back to kind of where China was almost 40 years ago. That's where India is today. It may follow a path of that red line as they start to electrify their economy. So here's coal, and here's natural gas. Natural gas is growing faster than coal for power gen globally. It was 38% back in 85, and it's over 60% now, growing towards 70% natural gas coal ratio globally. Solar is growing exponentially. The rate of solar is fastest of any form of energy. You'll hear that, and it's true, but rate isn't the, the whole story, is it? So here's all of our energy, and I'm going to lay wind on top of that. Wind is growing exponentially as well, so the rate of solar and wind are very fast. But what about total, total generation? I'm going to scale wind the same now as global demand. Here we go. So you see it down here. Remember, it's in the data. It's this light orange. 
So after 15 years building the best wind first, like in Texas, a lot of wind, a lot of hot air down here too. But but uh, that's what we built with wind. Wind and solar don't even account for the growth in electricity demand globally. The growth, much less what's already there. And here's some data, 2017 to 18. Yes, big rates of renewable growth, non hydro renewable, 14%. 300 terawatt hours, which is terrific. Natural gas only grew four, full three, but over 500 terawatt hours between those. So rates and amounts matter a lot. Let's talk about the environment in all this. The atmosphere, the land, the water and air. We're going to start with the atmosphere. That's the big conversation, climate change, CO2. Well, here's where CO2 comes from, from humans. It comes from a lot of manufacturing, driving ourselves around, heating and cooling things. The size of the square is proportional to the amount, by the way. Power gen, your world, and forestry and ag, which makes almost as much CO2 as power generation. Yet we tend to focus only on half, power and transport. That's where things are burned the most. Here's the emissions in the world. Again, North America and, and Europe have been flat and coming down in emissions. So we'll pat ourselves on the back. Who's going up? Asia, tremendously. A lot of new coal and other things too. And the rest of the world just getting started. More than half the world's CO2 emissions now come from Asia. Bad Asia. I can't believe how bad Asia is with all that CO2. Well, what's really going on? This plot shows the CO2 across the bottom, CO2 emissions against the, the consumption production ratio. So the red dashed line in the middle, that's the ratio. If you're above the line, you consume more than you produce. The United States makes five gigatons, five billion tons of CO2 every year. We consume more than we produce. China makes 10 gigatons, but they produce a lot more than they consume. In fact, most of the non-OECD, the non multi nations, are producing more stuff than they consume. And the rich club, us, the Greens, consume a lot more than we produce, especially in Europe. So the OECD is sending stuff, it's a technical term, to the consuming countries. And effectively, what are we asking them to do? We're asking them to put CO2 emissions into the atmosphere so they can make our stuff. It's fascinating, isn't it? In fact, it happens in the U.S. states as well. Here's the energy production in the United States, all 50 of them, plus D.C. on the end. Some want to make D.C. a state, it seems. And, and then here's our consumption. So the ratio of energy production to consumption looks like this. And the states are sorted by production to consumption ratio. Well, only 11 states make more energy than they consume. 39 are living in an energy deficit. And quite large ones. California only makes a third of the energy it consumes. New York a quarter, Florida just 13%. So you see Texas making more, we consume a lot, but make more energy and stuff. Pennsylvania, Wyoming. We're sending essentially energy and energy products, the producers to the consumers, and are getting back the CO2 effectively. So when you hear this whole zero emissions things, you gotta ask yourself, what's the strategy? Is it to buy credits from somebody who's actually saving CO2 emissions and so you can continue to admit because that seems to be the corporate and the, and the country and even the state plan. Let somebody else emit for us. How many atmospheres are there in the world? Only one. So that doesn't help climate. When somebody else is emitting your CO2 and probably more per unit product than you would, it's really not helping climate change. It's kind of a strange little shell game. So back to U.S. electricity generation. Oil has fallen tremendously. We'll probably continue to do that. Oil has as well. Natural gas has gone way up. Okay. So have the nuclears hung in there, and then the renewables have grown as well. And you see that's a reflection of shale. Shale gas has made it very cheap. Zooming in on the renewables, don't be confused. Almost half of renewables are wood, biofuels, and biomass in the U.S., and even more globally. So those are carbon fuels, you burn them. And hydro is another quarter, hydro and geothermal, and about a third is solar and wind. So a third of 11% in the US today is from solar and wind of actual generation. Air base and electric back in 2000, your capacity, and on the bottom, your actual generation, your energy. Now that makes us change in 2010. Your peak demand here is shown on top, and the actual generation below, you're starting to introduce the wind, natural gas, and some hydro more. Hydro was there. Hydro is shrinking as a percentage now because the total demand is growing quite a bit. 
So the percentages change when the total grows if, if you don't add new capacity, right? And so the wind is growing, natural gas is growing, and, and hydro and coal have shrunk in your capacity and your, and your actual generation. So kind of like the country is doing and the world is not quite doing yet, okay? The world's still heavily coal-based. As a result of this change in the United States, our CO2 emissions have come down 700 million tons per year. Back in 2005, they were 2,400. This is from the power sector. In 2015, 1900, a big reduction. Guess what happened in 2015? The Paris Accords. We didn't sign them. Our proposal was a clean power plan. It didn't happen. The, the clean power plan was going to reduce emissions 32% from 2005 by 2030. That's the green circle on the far right. So down to 1600. We were setting a base year of 2005. That was the highest year, it turns out. Well, guess what? We're already there. The emissions from the power sector in the United States have met our clean power plan targets a decade early. Why? Because fracking, gas was replaced coal, renewable policy mostly in the states, increased renewables, and then some efficiency, and then this thing of having other people make your stuff, which doesn't really count. But what if the world could do this? What if the world could replace coal with natural gas? Here's Asia, a lot of coal. It was 3x coal to gas in 85, and now it's five times coal to gas. Because both have gone up, it's actually 10 times more coal being used in Asia today than back in 1985. U.S. is just the opposite. Five times coal to gas back in 85, and now it's less than 1.9 coal to gas, thanks to cheap shale gas. Eight times the amount of natural gas in the power sector. If the world could do what the United States has done, replacing coal with gas, those CO2 emissions would come way down. That's actually one of the few scalable strategies. Nonetheless, people seem to hate natural gas. I took this picture in Aspen. These are the things you eat, sit outside and eat under a propane tank, heating the atmosphere directly. It's out the middleman. And I know Aspen is passionate about climate change. It says so on the propane tank, no global warming. <laughs> Remember, people don't know where electricity comes from, and they don't know that much about energy either. So how do you reduce CO2? Natural gas with some carbon capture and storage, and that's starting to get pretty strong looks. Nuclear? No emissions, coal with CCUS. Geothermal and hydro, if you have those resources, these are all resources. They're not everywhere. Centralized wind up the wind corridor and distributed renewables for the for the billion people in the world that don't have anything right now. Distributed is the only way to get there. There's no pipes or roads, etc. And then some efficiency and conservation. You know, doing more with less. And that's powerful. We got a little uh, con you, know, you look at this and I've grade some things out. The three big ones, the ones that could actually address CO2 at scale in the time frames the climate models say is needed, natural gas, nuclear, and coal. Those are very popular with those that are passionate about climate change. It's one of the great ironies of actually addressing climate change. What would really do it? So we had a contest down in Austin for efficiency. You know, this house on the left won by a lot. Uh, the, the, the house on the, 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 the ditto house, you know. <laughs> The most efficient of all. I asked if we could do that, but it didn't work out. So coming back to this, the power sector has been good in reducing CO2, but in the United States, not much else, including in, in transportation, and pretty flat in our emissions. So enter the electric vehicle. And this conversation about electric vehicles is remarkable. When Tesla is worth more now than Exxon and Shell and BP combined, Tesla, who sells a few electric cars, but here's one, here's a Beamer, it's not a Tesla, and its license plate says Electron. They're very proud of its electrification. And it's charging electricity, it's made by what? Oh, by diesel. You can't make this up. Diesel, 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 diesel generators making electricity to charge an electric car, not simply for emissions. You kind of see that globally too. Let's take a look at the actual data. This is the electric vehicles deliveries growing exponentially. It's pretty cool. Now, China, delivers more EVs than the rest of the world combined. And they have a policy to continue to do that. Remember where China's electricity comes from? Two-thirds coal. So are those EVs clean in an emission sense? Not so much. It matters what you charge your vehicles with. I didn't have any, you know, I didn't have any accurate number. I just made this one up. Studies have shown accurate numbers are even more useful than ones you make up. How many studies showed that? 87. 
So, so let's look at some, some accurate forecasts. Here's Bloomberg. They say we're headed to 60 million electric vehicles sold each year by 2040. Where are we today? Around three. So let's scale these the same. Here we go. You know, so we're going to grow like this, according to Bloomberg. The area under that curve is 600 million new EVs. Turns out that's about half of the world's total vehicle fleet. 600 million charging with batteries. This is a Tesla S battery, one of them. Three inches long, an inch wide, cylindrical. It's a lithium ion battery. There are 7,100 of those in a single Tesla S. 7,000 batteries in a car, 7,000 cell phones in a car. Now that's a big car, so let's use 5,000 cell phones. 5,000 batteries times 600 million, half the world fleet. That's 3 trillion new batteries. 3 trillion. We have tens of billions of batteries in the world today for all of our various electronics and gadgets. What's 3 trillion look like? I'm going to cover a U.S. football field, end zones included, in Tesla S batteries. Well, it's 2.7 million batteries. Let's stack them across the UT football field. 2.7 million. I'm going to stack them an inch at a time and layer these solid, you know, group of batteries going up into the air. How high does it go before you get to 3 trillion? Well, it turns out it's higher than Mount Everest, cumulonimbus clouds, commercial jets, biplanes, the blue jet, up into the stratosphere. A solid stack of batteries 30 kilometers tall. Now, I know Tesla owners are proud, and they're, they're amazing vehicles. Look, they're fun to drive. But no oil on the license plate. I guess it doesn't have tires or plastic in it. You know, it may as well say mining because that those batteries come from mining. And I'm a geologist. I don't mind mining. Let's at least know where they're coming from. Rare earth exports are controlled by China. The rest of the world, not so much. Lithium and cobalt, the mining is increasing, and that's really ahead of the electric vehicles. It's going to go up exponentially literally where do those come from china controls 60 percent of the world's lithium 70 percent of the world's cobalt not so much in the world's nickel yet but give give them time peacefully acquiring and openly acquiring mines all over the world and while, while we're at it to make solar panels requires polysilicon a lot of it guess who just 15 years ago started into polysilicon and now china produces more than 60 percent of that so it's not just the security of that risk that, that we're going to move from OPEP controlling liquids for our vehicles to China controlling the batteries. It's also the human rights. This is just from a couple of weeks ago. All the time we're reading about the human rights violations for mining. And most of the kids I know don't think mining is green, okay, as an aside. So it sounds good, but, you know, this putting in these posts to keep people parking from parking next to the building sounded good to these guys, but they forgot where they parked. <laughs> okay. And sometimes things that like policies that sound good, we kind of forget where we park. We put in these posts and they're hard to take out once they're in. So the environmental impacts are very real of energy. Coal oil and natural gas, it's dramatic. Mining and manufacturing to make the stuff and drilling and completion, handling the water, recycling, disposal, transportation in various forms, refining your petrochemicals, and finally burning it. It has a big environmental impact. Fossil fuels do. Natural gas a lot less than oil, less than coal. But it worries people. Here's some young people back on a Save the Earth Day. They're protesting. They were skipping school. They have the, you know, they have the right to protest, and I admire that. But what are they protesting for? Remember, we most of us don't know where, how electricity is made. They're protesting for the clean energy. Good and bad, clean and dirty. Oh, wait. You have to mine and process the panels and, and the turbine blades and all the battery stuff, and you have to make them in these giant gigafactories. It's a cool name, but it's a chemical plant. You have to produce trillions of them, produce on the land, use the land, and, and power lines to move them. Texas has five massive 345 kV power lines to move our wind to the cities. And finally, where does it go? It goes into landfill. We cut them up, the blades in Wyoming, we, we bury the solar panels and the batteries, and they, they, panels and batteries are toxic. So here's some different kids. They're not protesting. They're at the school outside of Nairobi in Kibra, where he's filmed and switched on. Inside that school are two light bulbs now, 
things to access to electricity for the first time. And they're studying English, past and present tense. This is a book. These are books. This is a cup. These are cups. And they're, they want to be in school. They're trying to emerge from severe poverty and lift themselves up, as are five to seven billion other people in the world. So it's a market educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Wouldn't it be great to have civil conversations, entertain thoughts without having to accept it? And this whole drill, baby, drill thing, remember that? Fossil nuclear to, to, the, to the economy, but it kind of leaves out the environment. On the other hand, there's the equivalent now. It's called the Green New Deal. It's renewables to the environment to skip the economy. It's really not very green, as I've showed you. Not new, certainly. And a few trillion bucks in the U.S. alone, is that a deal? So it leaves off the economy. In fact, these three E's, they waltz together. Energy underpins the economy. As you've seen, I've showed you a lot of data. And it takes a healthy economy to invest in the environment. Kids coming home from school in Kibra, they're walking over mounds of garbage, polluted water and soils, local air that's terrible. This, they can't afford to clean it up. They have a different challenge. In fact, globally, if you look at clean air, another big issue, the cleanest air, the greens and the yellows, are where it's rich. And the dirtiest air is where it's poor. This dance between energy, the economy, and the environment is real. You have to have healthy economies to invest in regulation in the environment. So now you've seen where the lights are on, and now you know why. There's energy. You know why they're off. So leaving 85% of the energy in the ground, the Green New Deal or its equivalents, really? Is Russia going to do that? The Middle East, Africa, is, is Southeast Asia, where half the people in the world live? Even Europe and the United States, really? Let's just dampen the world's lights by 86%. How does that look? To me, it looks like the past, not the future. So let's move into the future. Let's bring energy to the world, hunger, clothing, shelter, the things you would expect, but also education, lights at night, health care for refrigerators and vaccines. Women are going for the water, cooking indoors, not going to school when their male counterparts are. Energy poverty differentially impacts women. Immigration and migration, autocrats in a lot of these countries are corrupt. They don't want their people to have energy and get educated and vote. Fertility rates are directly tied to education, tightly directly tied to population, investing in the environment and adapting to climate change, which is happening. Energy allows for lots of adaptation, air conditioning, farming practices, etc. You bring all this together, and that changes the world. And I think that's what we're all trying to do. And I know you're trying to do that. And sometimes you probably feel a little beat up for the good work you're doing. Let me wrap it up here. Electricity demand will grow, especially if EVs are mandated like they have been in, in California, New Jersey. The internal combustion engines, EVs, and, and fuel cells, hydrogen, natural gas, are going to compete for market share. That's a good thing. Portfolio. Coal will decrease further in the U.S. Natural gas, solar, and wind will continue to grow. Carbon capture may grow to capture the emissions in key areas. That's coming. Solar and wind will hit a limit based on physics and economics and their environmental impact, which nobody seems to be talking about, but it's very real on nature. Energy storage will improve, but it's going to reach its limits too. It's going to require load following plants, mostly natural gas, to back up the solar and the wind. Nuclear and geothermal are really unlikely to play a big role in the next decade, although geothermal has a shot. Nuclear is playing a big role globally, certainly. Land, air, and water will rejoin climate as important environmental impact of energy. Climate has the whole stage right now. When you start to go down the low-density intermittent road, we're going to start to look at the mining and nature again, and they're all important. So the radical middle. It feels sometimes like it's shrinking here in the United States and Western Europe. A lot of controversy and polarization. It's growing in a lot of the rest of the world. Excitement, energy, emergence development, et cetera. We got to join and be part of that conversation. Reduce the impacts of all forms of energy on all forms of the environment. End energy poverty, build the economy. We have fossil fuels continue to pull the gas, efficiency, nuclear, geothermal, hydrogen, fuel cells, and finally distributed renewables for the people who don't have any. That is a sustainable transition because it engages the economy, it engages energy, and it engages the 
environment, to a whole environment. It takes nonpartisan energy education, critical thinking. And that's what we're doing at Switch. If you haven't been to switchon.org, check it out. Love to have you look at our films and all the small format, short format stuff we've made. It's in high schools now across the country, universities around the world. Been a lot of fun. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Good morning, Dr. Tinker. This is Chris Baumgartner, Senior Vice President for Member Services and Administration. We had a chance to visit a few days ago. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, we wanted to entertain some questions, a Q&A session here with our membership. And so we will try and give the members a time. If, if they have a, a question, they can type it in or they can raise their hand and we will try to recognize them and open their microphone. Don't be shy. I'm a, I'm a professor, so I love questions. <laughs> It'll be very candid. You know, I'm not elected. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read one question to you that just came in here. Sure. Um, what do you see as the future of nuclear in the United States or the world? Well, I think nuclear has to be part of the conversation. Uh, it's growing in China. They're building close to 50 new nuclear reactors today. The Middle East just opened a new nuclear reactor in the United Arab Emirates, $22 billion for about a 4.4 gigawatt facility, but in the Middle East. Yeah, it's a very efficient form of electricity generation, as you know, no emissions, and it has a remarkable safety record. If you look at it on a kilowatt hour basis per human impact, a remarkable safety record. So I see the world developing nuclear. I think India, when it really thinks hard about it, is going to develop nuclear as well. It's pushing coal hard and renewables now, but I think you're going to see it. The U.S. is tougher, so is Western Europe. There's there's worry over radiation, and, I, and perhaps just big industry. So three to four new brownfields were permitted under Ernie Monee when he was Secretary of Energy in Obama's second term. Ernie's a good friend of mine. And, but that's about it so far. Um, I, it'd be tough to CME CEO of a big power company pushing nuclear forward hard unless the emissions become uh, get a cost to them and a big carbon price of some kind. And I'm not an advocate of that, by the way, but if that happens, then zero emissions, things like nuclear at scale are going to live large because I think we'll realize quickly you just can't put in enough turbines and, and, and solar panels and batteries to back them up to meet the time frames and the scale that's needed. So nuclear could come back in the U.S., but right now, it, and, and, and you know where they are, mostly in the Northeast and the East and the Southeast. We have four reactors in Texas. So you know, we'll see what happens there, but uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of nuclear. I don't have any money invested in it. I just think it's, it's a remarkably dense form of electricity generation and quite clean. You have to, you have to manage the waste. We're pretty good at doing that. Small modular reactors, I'll just finish with this thought, like new scale out of the companies, 50, 100 megawatt reactors. That's very fascinating. Can you put a small modular reactor, which are next generation technology, so a lot lower waste and, and inherently safe. Can you put them in smaller villages and towns around the world, even in the U.S., as a, as a source of good baseload electricity? We'll see if that begins to happen. But they've crossed a lot of regulatory hurdles. I'm not talking about fusion, talking about fission. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got a few more here. I'm going to try and, and uh, paraphrase a little bit. This question here says, we appreciate your concern about the environmental impact of rare earth batteries, solar panels, and such. It says, do you have a, a way to show your comparative analysis? Is that something you can share, your comparative analysis between carbon-based energy and non-carbon-based, if you want to call it that, in regards to the complete environmental impact you know these studies are being worked on finally now i've got a graduate student and uh, some things being done but even more broadly than that we're finally finally starting to quantify because climate has captured the the minds of a lot of people particularly in developed nations i've been in 65 countries by the way on all six continents and i can tell you um in many of those in the 
four areas, climate change is not front of mind. Food and, and shelter and clothing and education, things like that are front of mind. Climate change is a distant somewhere down here. But in the developed nations, it is. Because it's captured that CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases are, are the big issue. It seems like the only objective right now. You have to be willing to quantify that against mining and manufacturing and landfill disposal and use of water. So I highly recommend a book to you by Michael Schellenberger. It just came out this year. Michael is a time hero of the environment, worked in a couple of Democratic administrations, was a big, um, he called himself a climate alarmist, and he's still passionate about climate change, but he's given some TED Talks and written a book. He's kind of come out now, This it's a terrific book, heavily referenced it. Why Climate Alarmism Hurts Us All. It's called Apocalypse Never. Why Climate Alarmism Hurts Us All. And he's a staunch, staunch environmentalist in the earned stripes. It goes through chapter by chapter, some of the impacts that could come, but a lot that probably aren't going to happen and where other impacts loom larger, including the use of land and water. So it's starting to happen. And I think that's why one of my bullets in the summary said, you know, land and air and water are gonna rejoin the atmosphere as big environmental issues with energy as we go forward. And they need to. Switching to uh, coal, we've got a question. Basically, can carbon capture slow or stop the decline of coal? Or is the mentality that it's black, it's dirty, it's coal, and it's just bad? Yeah. Uh, again, U.S. and Western Europe versus global. It's going to be tough to stop the decline of coal for a little while longer, I believe. And it's 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 partly the perception of coal as black and bad, but it's partly economics. Natural gas has a lot of the same advantages as coal. But it doesn't have the socks and the NOx and the mercury and the particulates. It has CO2, but they're lower. Now, there are methane emissions. Tighten down those valves. And it's very affordable. I showed you the data with Marcellus and the other shale gas basins. It turns out that West Texas is producing more natural gas than any other shale gas basin except the Marcellus, and it's associated with oil. So for, for a while, you know, affordable, available, reliable natural gas is competing with coal. And that's, in my opinion, driving a lot of that switching. Nuclear is there as well. Now, what people are going to realize again, you know, droughts impact hydro and it's in terms of its intermittency. But they're going to, people are going to realize as you add more and more intermittent energy into the grid, like we have, we have a nice experiment in Texas, it's called ERCA, Electric, Electricity Reliable Council of Texas. We, we're our own grid. That allows us to secede from the union someday. We, in our own constitution, we can secede <laughs> in Texas. But, uh, you know, here sits ERCOT, and, and we have a lot of wind, and all summer long it risks brownouts every night because you're taking the wind, and you're required to take the wind, and shut down the natural gas, the load followers, and even sometimes the coal. So there's going to be rule changes that go on, I think, the more and more intermittent energy that comes into the grid to keep it reliable and stable and affordable. And here's the trick. You hear the cost of wind and solar come down. That's true on the panels and turbines and at the gate. But if you look at the cost of electricity in California, in New York, in Germany, and other countries or states that have a lot of intermittent energy, the cost of the consumer is more. Germany's paying about 30 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. California, twice Texas, because you have to have that redundant backup, either the batteries or the redundant natural gas load following plants. And those aren't in LCOE, the levelized cost of energy, the LCOE, which people use to compare, doesn't include backup. So when you include the backup, which is very expensive, the cost to the consumer is higher. And that, that story is beginning to be told more broadly, and it needs to be told. So I think, again, you know, coal is probably coming down for a while longer here. It's going to get to some base, the newer plants better. And if CCUS could come in, your question, and capture the emissions and store them, it can technically. I have one of the biggest teams in the country that's been doing that for 20 years, looking at the engineering and science. It works, but it's the economics. So how much government subsidy, essentially, through 45Q, which, look that up if you don't know, 45Q is the big incentive program for 
to the CO2 emissions. And it works quite a bit these days under Trump raised it a lot. So, you know, if it starts to, to be effective, yeah, coal could find a place. It, you know, it's cheaper to actually grab CO2 off of a natural gas plant energetically than off a coal plant. So you might see CCUS on gas even more. Globally, conversations are there, but, you know, a lot of the coal consumption in the world is in Southeast Asia. You'll see that in, in our film switch on. We went to Vietnam. They're building 50 new 400 megawatt coal plants in the next 20 years in Vietnam to compete with China. Cheap electricity. They're not going to have CCUS. It, neither does China. So at one atmosphere, <laughs> you know, you got to think about where it's all happening. I think regionally you'll see some of it, but uh, it'll be in the places where it makes the most sense and can be at least close to economic. Sorry for that long answer, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty intricate uh, subject, and it's not all the same. Okay. Well, as you've been saying, a lot of these these answers are not simple. They're complex, and they involve a lot of different aspects. Just simply, and perhaps you've been doing a wonderful job in your in your video and in the work that you've been doing to try and educate people on again how electricity is made, where their energy comes from. Have you seen or created a white paper on units of energy consumed? versus units of energy saved in manufacturing batteries? <laughs> Have I seen the white paper? Not really. Um, I'm sure they're out there, but I don't remember reading the actual net energy of the full cycle for batteries. From the mining, it's very hard to do. and People are starting to look at the full cycle of all energy now. It's very hard to capture the mining components all over the world, the transportation of those, and, and the components come from everywhere. And then the construction, running the plant itself, and then moving the batteries to where they need to go, and then using them, and then they wear out and disposing them. So, you know, there's a lot of energy in that equation. Batteries are not the most efficient things, <laughs> and they never have been. They're improving some, but the classic you know, lead acid and then through various cations and anions, lithium ion or other kinds of metals, you, know, you can only get so much improvement. Now, solid state batteries could change that equation quite a bit. And then a lot of research is being done. In fact, at UT Austin, there's a guy who won the Nobel Prize just last year for his role in inventing the lithium ion battery. James Goodenough. And he, he's now starting on, in his second half of his career, on solid state batteries. I say the second half of his career. He's 98 years old, <laughs> and he still goes in every single day. So this guy is an amazing person. But, you know, it'll have to take a very different kind of technology. Affordability could come down. You could use some interesting things, cheaper metals perhaps. But right now, lithium and cobalt and nickel and other conflict uh, minerals and elements are, are big parts of batteries, and, you know, it, they're controlled. So... So the net energy, I'll have to think about that. It's a good question. See if I can find some good, good work or something. You made a, you made a comment um, to us when we visited last week, Dr. Tinker, uh, uh, when we talked about assets and, and pretend, let's, let's compare a gas asset that may be uh, amortized out over 30 years or more, but let's take 30 years. And you said compare that to uh, similar batteries or solar that over that same 30 year period, you would see the solar and the, the battery resources having to be replaced about every 10 to 12 years. Yeah. It, it, On the battery side, battery side is 10, maybe 15. Some of them are lasting longer than forecast in the vehicles, which is a good thing. But let's call it half of a 30 year amortization. Solar panels, uh, 15 to 20 years, depending on the environment. It gets scratched a lot uh, if you have a lot of sand blowing around, et cetera. You, and you mostly dispose them. It's cheaper to dispose and make new than to recycle and reuse, it turns out, on most things, unfortunately. And then the turbine blades, yeah, they are braided. Now, solar panels and batteries, they have toxic elements. Batteries a lot, solar or some. The turbine blades are inert, but they're gigantic. So, you know, you've seen them going down the highway. Check out, just Google, you know, Turbine blade disposal in Wyoming. They're, they're the first state doing this, and they cut them into thirds and stack them up, or they lay them down, and they're going to be there forever. I mean, these are these are kind of a polycarbon. They're going to be there forever, and and Texas has about thirteen thousand turbines now, I think, plus or minus times three. So let's call it fifty thousand 
blades in Texas? Where are they going to go? And then we have to make them again. And, and, and I just don't think we've really processed the whole clean and dirty stuff that your kids are learning in school. But with Switch, there's a the most popular AP class in high schools across the country now is called environmental sciences, AP environmental sciences. 200,000 kids take that every year. Switch is providing the energy month in that year-long class. We've two years we worked on it. We worked with the teachers, created the curriculum on our videos, developed the platform, rolled it out in August. 600 teachers have already signed up and are using it nationwide. So we're trying to introduce some just critical thinking, nonpartisan, pros and cons. And, and look, it's pretty biased right now. I'm not going to kid you. And not because they want it to be, just because the information they have available. So we're, we're doing that, and it's in all 50 states. It's, it's really exciting. And same with universities, et cetera. So, you know, let's keep working. I'm going to encourage you to get out there. Don't be shy. I put my slides, my animated PowerPoint slides, on our website, switchon.org. You can download them. I even have a little MP4 recording of what I would say about them. Put your own talk together. Go to a scout troop or a church group or a civic group of some kind and do a little talk on energy. You know, you'll be intimidated at first, but, you know, it's not, I can do it. It's not that hard. And, and begin to share your knowledge about these issues so that the public can get a little bit more energy educated, raise the IQ just a little bit so as we vote, we, we don't kind of think about this good, bad, clean, and dirty thing as it, if it as if it's real, everything is good, good parts of energy, and everything has challenges. They're, they're just different. So I've got a couple more questions here. We've got a little bit, a uh, few more minutes left. Um, given that uh, we are, as you said, we're still in the midst of the election, and uh, I can't let you leave without uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, what it's, this is maybe a two part question. Uh, you know, we've talked about our membership and the diversity of it, and so. Um, what what do you see as a change in administration? Uh, the effects on uh, the two parts of our membership. There's there's many, but I'm going to talk. We've I mean, already talked about coal, but uh, a change in administration. Do you see what kind of changes would you see on fracking? And then also, I want to switch to the second part of that, Doctor Tink, would be on agriculture. So many of our members, uh, egg based, um, a lot of a lot of corn producers tied to ethanol, and so maybe uh, maybe a two part question there, if you may. Sure. Yeah. Um... Look, I'm not, I'm not a political pundit. Um, it, in a Biden administration, uh, made some strong statements, less strong than the other nominees. Now, his vice president has made some really strong statements. Mr. Biden will be 78 on Inauguration Day, it turns out. That's eight years older than the next oldest elected or inaugurated president. And that was Trump. So he would be 82 at the end of his first term, and I'm not wishing anybody ill, but 82 years old is with the strains of that job. And you can see a Kamala Harris as president even in the first term. I don't mean that in any way other than just statistics. Okay, that would be fascinating. Now, it also depends on what the Senate does. The Senate is close to flipping, plus or minus. If it flips, you probably see some things get shoved through in that first year or two. That would have some impact on hydraulic fracturing. Uh, they're all over the board on it and have made lots of different statements that they have denied later and maybe maybe evolved and evolved in their thinking. But even on public lands, that affects about 10 to 15 percent of the production in the United States. And that's not trivial. I think that Russia and the Middle East are just hoping that we put moratorium on fracking. You know, because they control the world's conventional oil and gas, and they would love to get back to doing that. So in terms of energy security, and they're also hoping we go to electric vehicles, because <laughs> China controls that too. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting energy security conversation. Um, in terms of costs with the Biden administration, you know, when you put more intermittent energy into the mix, electricity only, it raises the price of electricity to the consumer. And the data are very clear on that. Price of gasoline goes up if we're producing less, less supply globally goes up. Now, if you increase the price of gasoline and electricity, everybody pays the same for that, no matter what your income is. I pay the same as my kids who, who don't, you know, they're one of them in school still. 
So when you pay the same for a commodity that you have to have, it's called regressive. <laughs> it's a regressive tax, electricity and, and gasoline. So if our policies are increasing the cost of that, it's actually having a regressive impact on people who make less money. I'm always surprised when the progressives push as hard as they do for a regressive impact. I, and I don't know that that's been made clear to people, but it's it's, it's easy. It's not, not it's a nonpartisan statement. It's just data. So that will be one of the effects as well in, in a Biden administration, depending again on what the Senate does. If the Senate doesn't flip, you know, I think you see gridlock for a long time, and maybe that's okay. Um, I don't know where the states are now. I think Pennsylvania, uh, North Carolina, Michigan, Georgia, those are the four big states that were very, very close. If they go Trump, he wins. If they one or two of them goes Biden, he wins. So that's where it is. <laughs> Any, any follow-up thoughts on ethanol very quickly? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I know this is not going to be popular, but, and we have, we have a corn farm that was my great grandfather's in Northwest Ohio and corn farm. So, um, you know, and corn ethanol is, is farm policy. It was when it was put through to help the farmers. It's not energy policy. Corn ethanol, in fact, all biofuels are not really very efficient uses of things. It, you're taking a carbohydrate, a plant, and maybe just the food for that plant and converting it into a liquid fuel. Nature did that. It's called oil <laughs> and natural gas and coal, even compacting carbohydrates into hydrocarbons. So it's not a very efficient form of energy. In a few places, it makes sense. Brazil does a good job in some parts, I know. So policy-wise, I'm not going to comment one way or the other if it's a good thing for the U.S., just from an energetic perspective, not the most efficient way to put liquids into vehicles. Not going to kid you on that. So, you know, where does the policy go? I don't know. Um, with oil as cheap as it, as it is now, it's tough even, you know, you're having to force ethanol standards into the gasolines because it makes it more expensive, uh, at least today, with the cost of oil as low as it is. Probably not going to get me elected, <laughs> but, but you're asking me to be honest. So let's uh, we'll see it. I, I am. We're going a little bit long with questions, and if you just, uh, I'll, I'll give one more to you, and this might be a, a loaded question. Sure. You, 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 you saw that we shared a couple of slides with you, and we've shown that over the last 15 years or so, a, a great proportion of our growth, and we are a growing membership. Most of our growth has been met with uh, renewables, with gas, and utilizing the markets. Mm -hmm. um, as we look to continue to grow over our next 10 years in our load forecast, any recommendation on what fuel source we should be focusing on? Yeah. You know, we use the word renewable, and I don't know if I mentioned this in my talk, but the sun and the wind are renewable, but the stuff that we mine and manufacture and then dispose and do over and over again, that's not renewable. So there's no renewable energy. The collection systems are not renewable and you have to collect energy. So I think you're going to see a little bit of changing conversation in that. Um, but you know, certainly a component of wind and solar makes good sense. I think an emission sense and a low carbon sense, uh, that, as long as you can manage that in the portfolio. Natural gas, I think I've always felt as a remarkable fuel, very versatile transportation, cooking products. Um, and for, for power generation, as long as it's affordable, a decade or two decades, I think you're in pretty good shape there with natural gas in that mix. And in terms of following load, it's the best fuel. We don't cook inside with charcoal for a reason. Electricity even takes a long time to warm up. Fire up that gas grill, boom, it's on. There's the heat. Boom, it's off. So, you know, natural gas is great for load following. So I would, I think that partnering natural gas with uh, growing renewables is a very good strategy. Some geothermal might be worth looking. Uh, even, you know, uh, you have to think about that, but some component of geothermal for emissions, no emissions. So if you're mixing it in and mandates come, that's not a bad piece to be thinking about in your mix. How do you look at a little bit of that? I like nuclear. I don't know what your politics are there, but maybe a small modular reactor or two. We work with New Scale and others. It'd be interesting to see how those might be distributed and put in places where it's tougher to get your base load. Coal, we've talked about already, it's gonna be in the mix, but I think it's gonna be coming down. So, you know, that's kind of, 
That's kind of how I see basins mix. I think you're good. I think it's really wise to diversify the portfolio in anything, stocks, real estate, energy. It's good to have optionality in there. So I like that trend that you're showing. I, I wouldn't lose too much more coal out of it and natural gas and base load because you need it. Otherwise, you start to risk these, like in Texas, the rolling browns and even blackouts. California is pointing a lot of fingers, <laughs> but it's largely its own forest management and energy policies that have, that have resulted in what's happening today in a drought. And, and that's, that's optionality. So don't, don't get to where you're an importer. You know, I'm glad you're producing a lot of your own energy. And it's been a treat talking to you. Again, I said earlier, if, if nobody thanks you for what you do lately, um, thank you. You know, the world, the country needs electricity that's affordable and reliable. And you're doing it. So as a consumer, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tinker. We do have a few more questions, but so we may be following up with you and getting back to those folks that uh, sent those questions in. You sure. gave us a lot to think about today. Again, we would encourage folks to go to switchon.org to see your most recent video uh, and follow up on this information. Thank you again for joining us. And thank you again for all of the, the members who submitted questions. My pleasure. Keep up the great work.